Good morning. How you guys doing? You doing all right? Glad you're here this morning. You may not know this. Maybe you're sort of new to the vineyard. The vineyard is really a family all around the world. I think we're in something like 94 different countries or something like that. We have vineyard churches. We have about uh, 550 vineyard churches around the U.S., another 1,500 vineyard churches around the world. And so it's not just one or two churches. We really are a family. And so I bring uh, greetings from some of your long lost cousins in Phoenix that you didn't know you had. Okay. And so we're family. It's great to be here. I also want to just tell you, you know, maybe you're new to church or whatever. You may not know this. Your pastors, Andy and Sharon Mead are amazing people. Yeah. You need to give it up for them. They're, they're amazing people. You're really, really blessed to have them. Well, how many of you are parents? Anybody a parent here? My wife and I are blessed to be parents. We have a, a, a daughter, Zoe. She's going into eighth grade. And we have a son, Luke, who's going into seventh grade. And uh, one of the things that all of us as parents do when our kids are little, you know, littler than that, is we always try to tell them how big they're getting. You know, Luke, look what a big boy you're getting to be. Zoe, what a big girl you're getting to be so big. Don't we always do that as parents? And why do we do that? Well, we do it because we want our kids to know that they're getting big, that they're not small and weak and insignificant. We want them to know that they're big. And the question that I want us to look at this morning has to do with this whole issue of big. How big is God? And we actually asked that question to some of the children in our Vineyard Kids ministry back in Phoenix, and here's some of what they had to say. Um, my big is a building, bigger than me. Very big. Really big. Really big. He's huge. Ice cream. <laughs> big as the sky, I guess. 161. I feel like he can always hold the whole world. He's bigger than anything. Um, a mountain. Bigger than the Earth. Big as a galaxy. Bigger than a galaxy. I don't know. As big as space. The whole universe is like, you can't believe it. It's like, how big is like the whole entire Earth bigger than that? As big as Jupiter, as big as the Sun, plus as big as the galaxy. Maybe about as big as the galaxy, because he has lots of power. God is stronger than Anybody? God is stronger than a monster. So powerful! <laughs> There's no words I can explain about it. He's really strong. And God is bigger than this whole earth. I believe in him. I love the one, how big is God? 61. <laughs> you know, I'm convinced that the way that we live is a result of the size of our God. And the problem that many of us have, even as followers of, of Jesus, is that we make in our minds, we make God too small. You know, most of us are not really convinced that we are absolutely safe in the hands of a very big, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-loving God. And if I wake up in the morning and I go through my day with sort of a small God, there are consequences. I'll live in a constant state of fear and anxiety when I'm living with a small God. Because when God is small in my mind, in my heart, everything now depends on me. You know, if I live with a small God, then whenever I have a need, I'll find it sort of unnatural to pray because I'm not really sure whether God is big enough to answer my prayers. I'm not really sure that prayer actually matters all that much. If I live with a small God, then whenever I need to give somebody a word of confrontation or challenge somebody, I'll usually end up pulling my punches. Why? Because if I don't live in the security of a big God's acceptance, then I'll become a slave to what other people think of me. If I live with a small God, 
Then whenever I face the temptation to speak deceitful words or, or to lie in order to avoid trouble of some kind, I'll usually do it. Because I'm not worried about the consequences if God is small. See, when we shrink God, we end up offering prayers that have little faith behind them. We end up offering worship with no awe in it. We end up serving without joy. We end up suffering without hope. And the result of living that kind of a life is a life of fear and stagnation. And so it's against that backdrop that the writers of Scripture never tire of telling us over and over and over again, you do not live with a small God. You serve a great big God. And so this morning, we're going to look at what it's like to live with a God who is very, very big. And we're going to do this by looking at a person who lived way back in the Old Testament, back in the book of Judges. Now, the book of Judges was written during a period of time before Israel had kings, you know, like King David and so forth. Now, at this time, the, the Israelites, God's chosen people, they were living in the promised land, but they had all kinds of problems. And those problems were called the Midianites. And during this time, the Midianites would continually attack Israel. And they would take over all of their crops. In fact, things began to be so bad that the Israelites started living, started living in caves and living in holes in the ground and so forth. And at this time, the Israelites had also not been giving God much attention for quite some time. But as we're apt to do in these kinds of situations, you know, whenever we have all kinds of pain in our life, like the Israelites were going through with the Midianites, the, uh, the Israelites began crying out to God to come and help them. They were, they were saying, God, would you come and help us? And so God comes to one of the most unlikely characters in all of Israel. He comes to a man by the name of Gideon. Now, we're going to start in Judges chapter 6. So if you have a Bible, I'd like you to click on in your electronic device, Judges 6, starting in verse 11. And we're going to kind of go through the whole chapter of Judges chapter 6. But before we actually read the scripture, I want us to, to just pause just for a moment in prayer. And I want each of us as individuals, but also as a, as a church family, let's open our hearts to God. And our minds to God. And let's ask him specifically, God, would you speak to me out of the Bible today? Because, you know, God does that when we ask him to. He'll supernaturally speak to us. So would you just pause with me for a moment? Do your best to open your hearts, open your minds. And let's say, God, would you please speak to me? Okay, would you pray with me? Lord, that is our simple prayer request right this moment. That you would come, Holy Spirit. And you would use the Bible to speak into every one of our hearts, every one of our minds, whatever we need to hear from you, Lord, you would speak clearly and loudly. And I pray especially for myself, God, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would truly fill and empower me, that you would give me the gift of teaching so that I would teach the things that you, God, want me to teach. And Lord, if there are things that I've not thought about or studied for this message, and, and yet there are things that you want me to communicate, then I pray that you would drop those in my mind and in my heart as we go along. Because we truly want to hear from you and not from me. And so come and have your way, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Judges 6, starting in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now, sometimes this word here, Ophrah, it gets confused with the word Oprah. And so people start to think, is Oprah in the Bible? Is it like a biblical thing to watch Oprah? I mean, would that be a good thing? So let me be very clear. Oprah is not in the Bible. It is not a biblical thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's not a biblical thing to watch Oprah. However, the Bible does talk about the blessing that comes to us when we watch Oprah. ESPN. And it really blesses God when we watch ESPN, okay? But I just wanted to be clear that Oprah is not in the Bible. And so it says here that Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, an ancient wine press 
was like a little pit in the ground. It looked something like this. And normally, wheat would be threshed on a threshing floor, which was a flat spot out in the open where the wind would help separate the wheat from the chaff. And so a wine press, this little pit in the ground, that would be a terrible place to thresh wheat because you could only thresh this little amount of wheat in this little hole, in this little pit. You know, it'd be kind of like you trying to, to brew coffee in a thimble. You know, it'd be a ridiculous thing to do, wouldn't it? But the reason that Gideon is doing this is because he's terrified of the Midianites. He's afraid that the big bad Midianites are going to be spying on him and they'll end up taking away his little tiny bit of wheat. And so he's being ridiculously cautious and timid. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. And we're also told this because it's crucial to the story that we get the right image, the right picture of Gideon in our mind. See, Gideon is not some brave action hero. God is, uh, excuse me, Gideon is not a strong person. He's not like Samson. He's not a confident person. In fact, if a movie were made of Gideon's life, Gideon would not be played by somebody like Jason Statham, you know, or Antonio Banderas, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Daniel Craig, or John Cena. Nobody like that. In fact, let me show you a picture of the person you need to have in mind when you think about Gideon. Looks like this. <laughs> Barney Fife. That's who you need to have in your mind. If you're too young to know who Barney Fife is, Google it, okay? You need to know about Barney Fife. And so Gideon is a very fearful man. He's threshing wheat in a wine press because he's afraid of the Midianites. And so he's just trying to hide. He's trying to just get by. Story goes on in verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Now, just a little grammatical point here. When the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, that's written in what's known as the second person singular. See, in the original language, in the Hebrew language, it actually means the Lord is with you in particular. It's like the angel of the Lord is saying, hey, you, Barney Fife. You need to know the Lord is really with you. But that is so far beyond what Gideon can even believe. When he answers, he changes it to the second person plural. He says in verse 13, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? See, why does Gideon answer that way? Because Gideon is living with a small, distant, not very powerful far away God. And see, one of the consequences, whenever we live with a small God, is we live in a world without dreams. We live in a world without possibilities. We live in a world where we think things are never really going to change. Everything's always going to be the same. You begin to think that you can never be changed. You think, you know, my habits, my failures, my relationships, my financial situation, my job situation, all of my issues, those are never going to change. I'm always going to be the same. My circumstances are always going to be the same. And so you begin to have the attitude, I just need to learn how to settle. And so I'm settling for threshing wheat in a wine press because the Midianites are just too big for me. You know, maybe you've been living that way for a while. Maybe you think, you know what? My workplace is just too big for me. I can't make an impact for Jesus there. My neighborhood is too big for me. My world is too big for me. And so I'm just going to settle. I'm just going to try to survive. Let me ask you, are you settling in a particular area in your life? 
Are you living with a small God? And then the Lord says to Gideon in verse 14, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Now, how would you assess Gideon's self-image here? This is not a strong, confident person, is it? No, this is a very timid, fearful person. And here's the deal with Gideon. Gideon has found a way of viewing himself where he's able to rationalize his passivity. He's found a way of viewing himself where he's able to say no to God. He's found a way of viewing himself where he's able to say no to God's call on his life. And don't we do that all the time? I'll bet you've done that. I have. God, I can't serve in children's ministry. I don't know enough. I sin too much. I'm not a good enough example. I don't have enough time. I can't, I can't serve in youth ministry in this church. God, I, I don't know how to make a, a positive impact in the life of teenagers. God, I could never start a small group. Don't you know who you're talking to? This is me. I can't do that. God, I can't get to know my neighbors who live around me in order to try to make it a positive effect in their life for Jesus. I can't plant a church, God. Don't you know who you're talking to? Let me ask you, is God calling you to do something that you've been saying no to him about? You've been trying to view yourself in such a way where you can justify saying no to God? That's what Gideon's doing. And so he says at the end of verse 15, God, my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Israel, and I am the least in my family. And God says back, no, Gideon, you can do this. And you know why you can do this? Look at verse 16. Because I will be with you. And you'll destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And man, this is the hinge on which everything turns in Gideon's life. And not only in Gideon's life, but in your life and in my life. See, what is unthinkable on my own becomes unstoppable when it's God and me together. What is unthinkable on your own, what's undoable on your own, becomes not only doable, it becomes unstoppable when it's God and little Barney Fife. That's the way God does it. And so what the writer of Scripture is doing here over and over and over again is he's posing a question to us over again, all the time. How big is your God? How big is your God? Now in this situation, God comes to Barney Fife and he says, Hey, Barney, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live your life in hiding. You don't have to thresh wheat in a wine press because, Barney, you have a great big God. In fact, God is so big that he's calling you to do something unbelievable. And so get on with it. And so the story goes on. And God tells Gideon to begin this adventure with him by tearing down an altar built to the god Baal. See, the Midianites... And many other people in ancient Mesopotamia, they worshipped this tribal god called Baal. B-A-A-L. And Baal worship was associated with Celtic prostitution and a lot of sexual immorality, all tied up in the notion of fertility and making the earth a fertile place by the practice of very, very, uh, you know, very immoral sexual activity. And so there was no connection between worshiping Baal and ethics. You know, like righteousness or holiness or justice. There was none of that. And probably the worst thing about Baal worship is that it involved baby sacrifice. Now just think of the life of one baby. 
And how important the life of one baby is to every single one of us. And then think about thousands of babies being thrown away in the worship of Baal. It was an extremely dark thing. And so God says to Gideon, this altar to Baal has to go. Because I don't want anybody to think that I, as God, am anything like that. And so Gideon, I want you to take that on, and I want you to tear down this altar to Baal. But here's the kicker. This was not an altar to Baal that was built by the Midianites. It was built by the Israelites, by Gideon's own people. And worse than that, it was built by Gideon's own father, Joash. Now, how often do you think Gideon ever stood up to his dad? Remember, he said, I'm the least in my entire family. So look what happens in verse 27. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. So he obeyed the Lord. He went and tore it down. But he did it at night. Why? Because he was afraid of the other members of his family, uh, father's household and the people of the town. See, Gideon didn't want anybody to see him, so he does it at night. But the Bible says somebody does see him. And the story gets leaked. And Gideon's dad, Joash, finds out about it, and he finds out that it was actually his son, Gideon. And so everybody's wondering what Gideon's dad's going to do. And so Gideon's dad calls a, a meeting with all the people of the town, especially the men. And here's what he says in verse 31. Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, then let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. See, Gideon's dad, Joash, is basically saying, hey, it's time for us as Israelites to begin worshiping the true God. Man, it's beginning to look like Gideon's faith in this big God is becoming contagious. It touches the heart of his dad. And so now it's time for the big test. God tells Gideon that he wants him to go against the Midianites and free his people. But Gideon's very scared again. And so he says back to God in verse 36, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I'll put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I'll know that you're going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. Now you may have heard the phrase, I'm going to put out a fleece before God and see if he wants me to do, you know, X, Y, Z. You know, sometimes people use this idea of putting out a fleece to God. But I want to, what I want you to notice is that putting out a fleece before God was not a positive thing because God had already promised Gideon what he was going to do. And so Gideon was, was actually not expressing faith in God by doing this. He was expressing unbelief. And I say this because sometimes followers of Jesus use this fleece idea to sort of try to manipulate God or to use it as an excuse for not doing something they already know God wants them to do. You know, sort of like the old joke about the guy who, who was on a diet. And so he's driving down the road and he sees this donut shop up ahead and he puts out a fleece to God and he says, okay, God, if you really want me to, 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 uh, to stop in front of this donut shop and eat some donuts, uh, I want you to have a, a parking space open right in front of the donut shop. Then I'll know, God, that it's your will that I break my diet and I eat some donuts. And so sure enough, on the fifth time around the block, you know, there's a parking space right in front. But we do that sort of thing sometimes with the fleece deal. And that's what Gideon is doing here. But God is very gracious with him, and he actually does it two different times. And so finally, Gideon is ready to go up against the Midianites. And so in chapter 7, Gideon sends out a call to all the nearby tribes of Israel for soldiers to come and help him fight against the Midianites. And 32,000 Israelite soldiers come to help. Now the problem is, the Midianites have an army of 135,000 soldiers. And so Gideon is now outnumbered by a ratio of over four to one. And so God comes to Gideon and says, hey, the enemy has 135,000 soldiers. You only have 32,000 soldiers. 
You have a numbers problem. Gideon says, God, I'm so glad to hear you say that. Because I thought you were going to make me go up against the Midianites, even though I was outnumbered by a ratio of over four to one. God says, no, Gideon, I'm not going to do that. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because you don't even need close to 32,000 soldiers to beat these guys. You need to get rid of a whole bunch of soldiers. Because this is my battle. So I want you to go back to these people, to, to your soldiers, and I want you to tell them, anybody who's afraid, you can leave. Can you imagine Gideon's response? <laughs> so he goes to the 32,000 soldiers. He says, okay, if you're afraid, you can leave. 22,000 out of the 32,000 instantly go home. Now he's left with 10,000 soldiers. Now he's outnumbered by a ratio of more than 13 to 1. So God comes to Gideon again. And God says, Gideon, you still have a numbers problem. Gideon says, that's okay, God, I'm good. <laughs> Let's not keep going down this road, man, I'm good. God says, no, it's going another round. And so he, he says to Gideon in Judges 7, verse 5, when Gideon took his warriors, his soldiers, that 10,000 that are left, down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the 10,000 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Now, why Gideon was supposed to choose the men who lapped water like a dog is unclear from the text. You know, it's often been taught that the 300 men left, you know, the dog lappers, they did something deserving, and, and that's why they were chosen. You know, that by cupping the water in their hands and, and lapping like a dog, maybe they were more attentive if the enemy attacked them or something, and that's why they were chosen. Now, the problem with that is that in the Bible... Anytime someone is compared to a dog or referred to as a dog, it's always derogatory. It's never complimentary. See, the Bible is not sentimental about dogs. People didn't have dogs for pets in the Bible like we do today. You know, we love our dogs. We take care of our dogs. You know, we have a dog. How many of you have a dog? Yeah, a lot of you have. Do you love your dog? Most of us love our dog. How many of you have a cat? I'll pray for you. <laughs> but do dogs were a very derogatory kind of thing back then. In fact, Old Testament scholar Doug Stewart, he puts it like this. The idea here is that most likely the guys who lap water like a dog drank in such a way that we would think of them as kind of geeky, kind of nerds. And so these 300 guys that are left, these are not the elite troops. These are not the Marines. These are not like you guys have in Virginia Beach. These are not the Navy SEALs. Because, see, the whole point of winnowing down the troops was so that it would be clear when the battle actually came that the victory had been won by God alone. See, it was so Israel would be able to break this cycle of sin, of trusting in these little tribal gods, and begin to trust in the true God. The real God, the God who's so big. And so God leaves Gideon with these 300 dog lappers. These 300 geeky guys who would trip over their own swords. God leaves Gideon with 300 Barney Fifes. And now the Midianites outnumber the Israelite army, not by 4 to 1, not by 13 to 1, but by more than 450 to 1. And God has a reason for this. Well, God gives Gideon one more miraculous sign. God tells Gideon to take his servant, Pura, and sneak down to the edge of the Midianite camp and listen to what the Midianites are saying. And so they do. And when they get to the edge of the Midianite camp, they hear two Midianites talking. And one of them tells his friend about a dream that he'd had the night before. And in this dream... A loaf of barley bread comes tumbling down a hill, hits a Midianite tent, and knocks it flat. And the friend says, 
Your dream means that God has given Gideon victory over all the Midianites. Now, I have no idea how he could have got that interpretation of that dream, (laughs) but he did. And when Gideon heard the dream and he heard the interpretation, it gave him courage to finally attack the Midianites. And so Gideon goes back and he divides up the 300 dog lappers into three groups of 100 each. And he gives each person, each man, a ram's horn and he gives them a clay jar with a torch in it. And he tells them all, keep your eyes on me and when we get to the the edge of the Midianite camp, do what I do. And so they creep into the camp and the Bible says that on Gideon's cue, they all break their jars and they blow their horns. And the moment they do this, God causes all the Midianites to pick up their swords and start fighting against one another. And they all end up killing each other. And the text says that the few that were not killed by their own swords, they all run off to a faraway place. And Israel is now free. And now they know. And now they begin to understand who God really is. And how big God really is. See, God was saying to them over and over and over, you don't have to live in fear because the battle is mine. It's not yours. And so how about us? Without a show of hands, does anybody here ever deal with fear? You ever have any kind of worry in your life? Any anxiety about things that are going on around you or your work or your kids or, you know, what's happening in our nation? Man, I do. You know, when I start to think about all the things that are out of my control, people in my church that are going through difficulty after difficulty, you know, the economic situation in Phoenix is still really bad and People's economy is just not good. And I think about the incurable diseases of so many people in our church. That unless Jesus intervenes, there's no hope there. I think about my kids going into 8th grade and 7th grade and all the things that they're going to face in the future. You know, things like that. When I start thinking about those kinds of things, I don't know if you're like me, but I start to get fearful at times. I start to feel a little overwhelmed. My inner Barney Fife kicks in. And it's like, man, this is overwhelming. But you know, more and more, when those kinds of things are happening to me, I feel like Jesus is saying to me, you know, Brian, no matter what life throws at you, we're going to walk through this together. Because I really am big. In fact, I had an amazing experience. About a year and a half ago, I was meeting with a, a spiritual director And I'm not gifted really in like visions and dreams. I don't really get those kind of things. God speaks to me oftentimes through typed written words. I'll see those in my mind, but I don't really see pictures and all that. But after I was meeting with this spiritual director, he began to pray for me. And at the moment he began to pray for me, I was going through a really difficult time at that time personally and in our church. And at the moment he began to pray, Jesus actually came to me in this sort of vision, I guess. I don't know what to call it. And he was huge. He was so big. And he reached down with his hand and he took hold of my little tiny hand, my insignificant hand. And he said, Brian, we're going to walk through this together. You don't have to be afraid of this. If you'll just submit your heart fully to me and try to obey me and try to follow me the best you can, we're going to go through this together and we're going to go through everything that life has to bring to you. We're going to do it together. And when I felt that, it was amazing. And I have that recurring thought, that recurring vision of Jesus when I'm going through difficulties. I don't always have that. But when I do have that, you know, it's almost like I'm carrying around sort of a secret inside of me. And the secret is that God is really big. It's really big. And he can really take care of whatever comes my way. And of course, it's not a secret, is it? It's available to everybody. It's available to you. Because the fact is, 
God is enough. He really is. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. He's saying whether I'm sitting in a palace or I'm sitting in a prison, I can face anything life has to, to throw my way because Jesus will strengthen me. And I want you to know, nobody else can give this to you. You have to get it from God. It's between you and God. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ personally, I think Jesus has a word for you. And it's a good word. I think Jesus wants to say to you through me, I'm bigger than any problem you have. I'm bigger than any regret you have. I'm bigger than any sin. I'm bigger than any guilt. I'm bigger than any failure. And if you'll let me, Jesus says, if you'll open the door of your heart and surrender your life to me, I'll come into your life. And I'll forgive you of your sin. And I'll begin to lead your life from this moment forward. And no matter what life throws at you from now on, we'll go through it together. And then for those of you who do know Jesus, I think Jesus has a word for you too. I think what Jesus wants to say to you through me is that I know all about the Midianites in your life. I know all about your fears. I know all about your worries. I know all about your anxieties. I know about the problem in your marriage. I know about the problem with your kids. I know about the divorce you went through. I know about the abortion. I know about the job failure. I know where you've been stagnant. I know where your dreams have died. But, God says, I have new dreams for you. New dreams. And if you'll just ask me, he says, every day, if you'll just ask me, I will be as big of a presence in your life as you'll allow me to be. Because I'm so big, you cannot not even comprehend it. Let me ask you, how big is God in your life? Let's pray. Would you open up your heart to God right now? Maybe that concept is kind of new to you. That's okay. The Holy Spirit of God is here and He wants to minister to each one of us. He wants to touch you. So just do your best to open your heart and say yes to God. Come Holy Spirit. Have your way in each one of our hearts. You know, I don't know what God may have spoken to you about through this message. But whatever it is, would you just take these last few moments and just in your heart, just you and God, do whatever personal business you need to do with God. You know, maybe you're one of those that if the truth were known, you've been trying to justify saying no to some kind of call that God has on your life. Maybe it's for planting a church. I know that feeling. I said no for a long time. I just felt too inadequate. Maybe it's to start a small group. Maybe it's to serve in children's ministry or youth ministry. Maybe it's to serve in any way. You need to say, God, I want to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I'm saying yes right now. Or maybe you've been sort of settling. You've made God too small to ever be able to change you or change a relationship or change your circumstances. In fact, you haven't even been asking for quite some time because you've just settled. You just need to take a moment and ask God to forgive you. God, I'm sorry. I've made you small in my mind. I don't want to settle. God, I know you're a big God. And would you begin to give me new dreams? 
dreams about my work, dreams about my finances, dreams about my family. God, give me courage to begin to ask you again. Or maybe you're here and you're realizing you don't really know this big God. You don't know him personally. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You know, we in the vineyard, we would love to introduce you to Jesus. We would love to do it today. You could be assured today that Jesus will walk with you no matter what comes your way in life. You'll go through it with him together, just you and him. In fact, we'll have a ministry team here at the altar and we dismiss the service in just a moment. And we'd love to introduce you to Jesus if you don't know him or you're not sure if you know him personally or if you have any other prayer request. It may have something to do with the message. It may be totally unrelated. But we in the vineyard, we love to pray for people. We believe prayer matters. We believe God answers prayer. We believe prayer changes things. And so if you have a, a need of any kind that you'd like someone to pray for you about, please, before you go this morning, come to the altar. Find one of our ministry team members. Let them know what it's about. We'd love to pray for you. Before we go, though, I want to pray a blessing upon all of us. Could I have everybody stand who's able? And would you just receive this blessing from the Lord? Just try to open your heart and just receive this blessing from God. God, I pray for all my new friends here. I pray that you would really bless each one of them. Bless their bodies, their souls, their spirits. Bless them. Keep them. Cause your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your favor to each one of them, God, and give them peace as they go. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.